Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, sing together the gathering song. Only you guys hum while these people sing, and then we will do the welcome. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Just one verse. Welcome those watching on live stream online, whether you're here in Sarasota or far away visiting somebody else. And we especially welcome any visitors today who are with us for the first time here on campus or watching online. Please peruse the visitors packet that you were given by our greeters when you came in. If you didn't grab one, grab one on the way out. Or if you're viewing us remotely, look on the visitors pages online. Look at today's announcements printed on the back of the order of service if you're here or on our home page if you're not. And reach out to anybody, any of us, if you have questions. We're glad you're here and we want to help you find your way among us. I'm the Reverend Beth Miller, one of the associate ministers here, and I'm joined today by Catherine Bonner, our Director of Religious Education, and some of her students who are going to help us out in a moment. Our music team, Robert Laschetti and Don Brin, and our uh, masked choir members that are with us today, Kathy Cyrus and Jan Dorsett and Paul Lewis. And did I miss anybody? Nope, you're all, that, that's you. And our, um, our technical people, Klaus Obermeit and Doug Caldwell, and a new volunteer back in the booth today, Shells. And we also have greeters and ushers and hospitality and information table volunteers and RE helpers making everything work today. It is so good to be together with all of this activity. So thank you. Last week we had a table to sign up for some of those Sunday morning activities that we need help with. So if you didn't sign up, we've got several people that signed up, so thanks to all of them. And if you didn't and are interested, look at the contact that you got on Friday, the contact newsletter, and see what we need some help with still and um, how to get in touch with somebody to help you do that. I have a couple of special announcements this morning. Each month, uh, usually on the fourth Sunday, we donate the morning's collection to a nonprofit organization, usually local, and always vetted by our social justice committee. The designated recipient of today's Share the Plate offering is the Trauma Leadership Corps, of a project of uh, SRQ or Sarasota Strong. SRQ Strong and the Healthy Teens Coalition of Manatee County partner to help this local youth trauma training team. Young adult leaders ages 15 to 22 offer peer-to-peer -peer training and support to youth and youth serving providers in Manatee and Sarasota counties. The program benefits young people in various local youth settings such as Girls Inc. and ALSO and others. So you can contribute here this morning when our ushers take the offering later in the service or by clicking the donate button on the home page of our website or by sending a check made out to the church with share the plate in the memo line. The Trauma Leadership Corps will be grateful for your generosity. And we are having a Christmas toy drive to help mothers helping mothers bring smiles of joy to the families that they serve. To participate, please bring an unwrapped toy to the Sunday service or drop it off at the office no later than Sunday, December 12th. They need toys for kids from ages two through teenagers. 
You can check in at the social justice table near the Lexow wing after the service for a preferred list of toys, which will also be posted on our website on the homepage and probably in next week's contact, but I'm not sure about that. And now our prelude offered by Don Brin. <laughs> for chalice lighting are by Deborah Falk. A chalice lit in, the midst, in our midst is a symbol of our liberal faith, a faith built on the foundation of freedom, reason, and tolerance, a faith sustained by acts of kindness and justice, a faith that visions a world flourishing with equality for all her people, a faith that demands the living out of goodness, a faith that requires thoughtfulness, a faith of wholeness. In this spirit, we light the chalice this morning. Good job. And we light it this morning in recognition of our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and our fourth principle, interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. This tiny flame is the symbol of the spark of all within each of us. And now, a time for all ages. So we have an Advent wreath today, and we're going to do some lighting of the Advent wreath. And here comes Catherine. Hey, hey, Beth, what are you doing? Well, I'm getting the, ad, the Advent wreath ready to be lit. The what? The Advent? A advent? What is Advent? <laughs> advent is, as a word, means arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. In Christianity, it is the four weeks leading up to Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the celebration of Jesus' birth. Did you know? that Unitarian Universalism is a faith with roots in Christianity. Some you use today identify as Christians, others don't, yet during the season of Advent, something, there's something we can find illuminating, comforting, challenging, or fulfilling by reinterpreting old traditions. So that's what we're doing today with Advent. So, so when does Advent start? Today is the first Sunday of Advent. This year, during Advent, we'll light the candles in this wreath, one for each week leading up to Christmas, plus one more that'll be in the center on Christmas Eve when we have our Christmas Eve service. Folks are doing this in churches all over the world, using different prayers and songs and having their own interpretations of Advent. 
but all are waiting and spiritually preparing for Christmas. Well, holy smokes. Did you know that today is also Hanukkah's first day? That's what we're learning about in RE today. We're learning about Hanukkah. And, and did you know that Hanukkah came from a human rights protest? Uh, kind of? Yeah. Kind sort of. of. So uh, the Greeks, way back in 168 BC, um, they ruled Jerusalem, which was the home turf of all the Jewish people. But the Greeks outlawed their religion, and they forced them to worship Zeus. Yeah, right? Got it. Uh, crazy, I know. But, well, anyway, this group called the Maccabees, they said, no way! And then they fought and fought and fought, and they won their right to celebrate their religion the way that they wanted to. So they went back to their temple in Jerusalem to rededicate it. But for some of you that don't know that, Hanukkah means dedication, to rededicate the temple. And what they discovered was they only had enough oil to light the lamps for one day. But lo and behold, it lasted for eight days, just enough time to get some more sacred oil. I guess they didn't have Amazon Prime back in those days. Anyway, each year the Jews um, all around the world celebrate this event by lighting one additional candle e in the menorah. That's what this is. This is a menorah here um, for eight straight nights. Um, it's got four candles on each side, and then there's a servant candle in the middle to light all the others. And then each in evening, the children get a gift. Now, I don't, I don't know the tradition behind that. I think it's to compete with Christmas, but they made it longer. Think of the Jews. You know, they're going to rock it. So anyway... I'm so glad you're teaching our kids about Hanukkah, Catherine. That's just wonderful. You know that we celebrate these Christian and Jewish traditions as Unitarian Universalists because of our sources, right? The Unitarian half of our tradition came out of the Christian Reformation, and Christianity was originally a reform movement within Judaism. So our roots are deep in the Judeo-Christian tradition, even though our individual beliefs have gone in many different directions over the decades and years. But that's still important today because in addition to our seven principles, we have six sources of inspiration and guidance that we look to. The fourth source is Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. So we look to Christian and Jewish teachings for wisdom and inspiration. Hanukkah doesn't officially start, though, until the evening. But, you know, since we're here and not together in the evenings, I think it might be all right for us to light the first candle this morning in solidarity with all those, maybe some of you, who will be gathering with family and friends this evening to light the menorah and celebrate the first night of Hanukkah. Can we do that? Yeah, let's do that. Let me have Nora and Shaylin come back up. They're going to help us. Okay, I'm going to have Shaylin do the first part. So Shaylin, this is called the shamash. It's the servant candle. If you'll light it at the chalice and then light our first Hanukkah candle and then put the shamash back right in the middle. Ah, that's lovely. So the traditional blessing is, Praised are you, our God, ruler of the universe who made us holy through your commandments and commanded us to kindle the Hanukkah lights. And in Unitarian Universalist style, I would probably add, may we be especially mindful of your commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves as we enter this holiday season. Amen. So now, let's light our first Advent candle. Then we'll light one more each week to remind us of hope and peace and joy and love. As we light them through this season of waiting, let us try to be fully present with each other in all the moments that we share and with ourselves and with the source of all blessings, however we understand that. So, okay, so Nora's you know going to light the first one. Yep, let's light this one right here. Yeah, where everybody can see it. Awesome. All right. I'm and... <laughs> 
responsive reading, right? Yes, we do have a responsive reading. So, will the congregation please join in for a brief response of reading. We join with others from throughout time and beyond time in the practice of repairing the world. Change is possible. We give thanks for the role models of the past and for the leaders of the future. We light this candle for hope. May we find hope in this blessed season. Thank you, and thank you to all our helpers this morning. Go back to your seats now. And now please stand as you are willing and able and come along as our masked choir members sing hymn number 128 for all that is our life, verses 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. acknowledge and kick off the winter holiday season, this being Thanksgiving weekend, let's take a moment for gratitude. That is what we'll do during our centering time this morning. My friend and colleague Deborah Hafner wrote this Thanksgiving prayer. She said it was inspired by a prayer by Meister Eckhart who wrote, if the only prayer you ever say in your life is thank you, it will be enough. So in this spirit, let us enter into a time of quiet and contemplate with uh, each other with that time of uh, silence, her words in silence after the words are spoken, and then humming together, spirit of life. Thank you for all that is good in our lives. Thank you. May we shout thank you for the abundance of blessings. Thank you. May we feel thank you, thank you, thank you, deep within our hearts and around us right now. May we be thankful down in our bones for this time together. May we take the time to feed each other, take care of each other, appreciate and trust each other, and say thank you. It is the only prayer we'll ever need. Please join me in silence.
Elie Wiesel's book, Night, is his account of his experience in the concentration camps in Germany during World War II. In it, he describes the death by hanging of a young boy in one of the camps he occupied. I'm not going to read his actual account of it because it's really kind of hard to hear. But in summary, he says that because the child was very small, he didn't die quickly. And then Elie Wiesel writes, the other prisoners were required to watch this horror, and one of them asked facetiously and rhetorically, where is God now? And Wiesel writes, where is God now? And I heard a voice within me answer him, where is he? Here he is. He is hanging here on this gallows. May we contemplate this as Don plays Mendelssohn for us as the ushers receive your donations for the Trauma Leadership Corps of SRQ Strong.
Thank you, Don. That's one of my favorites. In a poem by Carter Hayward, The Enigmatic God, she writes, God will hang on the gallows. God will inspire, film, overwhelm, handle with power and splendor. God will be battered. God will have a mastectomy. God will experience the wonder of giving birth. God will be handicapped. God will run the marathon. God will win. God will lose. God will be down and out, suffering and dying. God will be bursting free, coming to life. For God will be who God will be. Our interlude is What If God Was One of Us by jo Joan Osborne. Oh, one of these nights and about 12 o'clock, this old world's going to reel and rock. Saints, we all tremble and cry for pain, for the Lord's going to come in his heaven airplane.
except for the Pope may be in So I've probably used that word God too much for some of you already this morning, right? <laughs> All right. I understand. I know. I know. I understand that it's a loaded word, a word with a lot of baggage. For some, the baggage is a ton of rejection, rejected meaning placed on it by the religions of our youth. For some, the baggage is meaningless blather relating to nothing we see as factual or even useful. For some, God is a perfectly good word we've created our own meaning for and use with a relative degree of comfort. Whatever your relationship with the word, I hope you figured out that I'm not referring to a transcendent supreme being who rules heaven and earth from on high this morning as my message to you. It is impossible to talk about different understandings of a concept without using the common word for the concept, right? So there you go. And the religious, win the religious winter holidays of our still predominantly Judeo-Christian tradition and culture here in America is all about God, a God who kept the flame burning when the sacred oil was gone, a God who manifests itself as a child who came to live among us. And we've always celebrated these holidays in our congregations, our UU congregations. So my pondering at this time of year goes to this question. For members of Unitarian Universalist congregations whose beliefs vary from atheism to agnosticism to various forms of theism, what, if any, are the common spiritual meanings that we can find in this season, this Advent season? Now, it wasn't until I had become a minister that I gave a lot of thought to the spiritual significance of Advent, to be perfectly honest with you. I remember getting those little cardboard Advent calendars as a child. Did you guys get those? There would be a special little window for each day of Advent right up to Christmas. And every day I could open the next little window and see a picture of some beautifully wrapped Christmas gift, or a Christmas tree, or a candle, or a star, a stocking, maybe sugar plums, or a, a gingerbread house. Each wonderful Christmas sight increasing my anticipation. I certainly was waiting during Advent, but for Santa Claus, not for God. Although I was a Sunday school going child who participated in the annual Christmas pageant and loved all the songs about Jesus being born in a stable and Mary and Joseph and the wise men and those shepherds and angels and all of that, still, it was Santa Claus I waited for. Then during my 20s and 30s, I was raising my own children and I was very involved as a layperson in my Unitarian Universalist church and participating in all kinds of church events throughout December. But I was also trying so hard to do the Martha Stewart perfect Christmas thing, wearing myself ragged all month, shopping and decorating and wrapping and baking so as to create some awesome Christmas experience for my family. I sang the carols and I loved the stories and symbols, but it was exhausting and having it all be over so that I could recuperate it and get back to my normal life, that's what I was waiting for in those years. But for the last 30 plus years as a minister, it's been my job to pay attention to Advent and the holidays, holy days of our culture and to try to make some sense of them. What I tend to wait for now is some feeling of spiritual significance some spiritual significant feeling to kick in for me. I'm waiting for the Christmas spirit to find me. Thinking about this reminded me of the beat generation poet Lawrence Ferenghetti's 
1958 poem, I Am Waiting. It's very long. I'm only going to do a few excerpts from it. And I'll give you a second between stanzas to see if that resonates with you or makes you think of anything. I am waiting for the second coming. And I am waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona. And I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored. And I am waiting for them to prove that God really is American. And I am seriously waiting for Billy Graham and Elvis Presley to exchange roles, seriously. And I am waiting to see God on television piped into church altars if only they can find the right channel to tune in on. They didn't have YouTube yet. And I am waiting for the Last Supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer. And I am perpetually waiting for a rebirth of wonder. A rebirth of wonder. Yes, that's what I'm waiting for during this Advent season, a rebirth of wonder. I think I've always been waiting for wonder, although I didn't used to recognize it that way. But thinking back, it did always arrive, that sense of wonder, sometimes sooner and sometimes later. Sometimes I waited passively, not even aware that I was waiting. And sometimes I conscious, consciously sought it out. Like it says of Mary in the Bible, I pondered it in my heart. And at some point, I would be touched by that sense of wonder. The Christmas spirit would arrive. Joan Osborne's song was released on November 21st, 1995. I don't remember when I first heard it, but ever since I've been aware of it, I've come to associate it with Advent, with waiting. What I'm waiting for during Advent isn't the rebirth or birth of God in the symbol of the baby Jesus, although that is a powerful symbol. For me, Advent is waiting for the birth and rebirth of my awareness of God or the Spirit or whatever comfortably you can call it, the rebirth or birth of my awareness of that in myself and in my ability to behold it in each of you and in everyone and everything. What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? It's easy to see God in a newborn child, but what about that slob on the bus? What about the stranger? What about the person sitting behind you or in front of you this morning? Can you recognize God in them? And can you treat each of them accordingly? You might recall that one of my oft-repeated points in sermons is that our seven principles are not easy. They are statements of aspiration and our spiritual growth challenge, if you will, is to keep growing into them, to bring ever more into alignment the principles we affirm with how we actually live our lives in the world. And that's a lifelong pursuit, and we never get it completely right. The two principles that speak directly to this idea of recognizing God in ourselves and in others, and to treating ourselves and others as such, are the first and seventh principles. We covenant to affirm and promote, first, the inherent worth and dignity in every person, and seventh, the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Now, if all existence is interconnected, including us, then whatever holds it all together must be inherent in us, right? And what does that mean? What if God was one of us or all of us? Joan Osborne, like me, has more questions than she has answers. If God had a name, what would it be, she sings. 
And would you call it to his face if you were faced with him and all his glory? What would you ask if you had just one question? Good questions. Advent means the coming or arrival, especially, of something momentous. Wouldn't the ability to really perceive divinity in the stranger on the bus or even the person sitting behind or in front of you this morning, not to just say it as a nice thing to say or even believe it intellectually, not to just profess it, but really feel it. Wouldn't that be momentous, to really feel a connection with the God and everybody? Alice Walker also deals with this in The Color Purple. Celie, the young protagonist trying to figure out and deal with her very challenging life, finds a friend, a mentor, and eventually a lover in Shug. I've never forgotten their conversation about God. It's in dialect, and I'll try not to mess it up. Here's the thing, say Shug, the thing I believe. God is inside you and inside everybody else. You come into the world with God, but only them that search for it inside find it. And sometimes it just manifests itself if you're not looking or don't know what you're looking for. And Celie asks, it? Yeah, it, Shug replies. God ain't a he or a she, but a it. Joan Osborne uses him, and we can just call that poetic license, but I join with Shug in thinking it. Anyway. But what do it look like, Celie asks. Don't look like nothing, she say. It ain't a picture show. It ain't something you can look at apart from anything else, including yourself. I believe God is everything, say Shug. Everything that is, is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you found it. And then Shug goes on to explain how she got past the traditional image of God that she had been taught as a small child, as a child growing up in her traditional religious perspective. She says, my first step from the old white man was trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it can come to me that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed, and I cried, and I run all around the house. I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happened, you can't miss it. Does that feeling ever come over you? It happens to me sometimes. When it happens during Advent, I call it the Christmas spirit that I was waiting for. Whenever it comes, it's inspiration. It's a universal kind of love that somehow just comes. It's what I feel when I manage to be my best self, which isn't always easy, easy believe me. And it isn't always easy because if God is within us, and if all things are connected and part of the whole, then we can't only feel the good stuff all the time. This awareness that the bad stuff, the things we would maybe consider evil, are part of the whole takes us back to the readings, the earlier readings. Eli Wiesel, describing the child's brutal death, says that this too is God. And Carter Hayward's poem, describing the both and of God within us, God will hang on the gallows, God will inspire and fill, overwhelm, handle with power and splendor. God will be battered. God will have a mastectomy. God will experience the wonder of giving birth. God will be handicapped. God will run the marathon. God will win. God will lose. God will be down and out, suffering and dying. So what do we do with that? Huh? What do we do? From our ethical point of view, it isn't enough to just say, yeah, if God's in everything, then God's in the good, the bad, and the ugly. From our ethical human point of view, we need to do something more than just that, although it's important to accept it, right? 
What about our human idea as, of God as love? Or our vision of the beloved community of a world made fair with all her people one? Is that not our aim? to make the world a better place by our presence. The writings of Vietnamese Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh offers some insight, perhaps. He wrote an essay following the war about the suffering of the refugees who wrote to his Plum Village community in France. The monks there learned that half, half the boat people fleeing that Vietnam died in the ocean. They also learned that at sea, pirates inflicted great suffering on the re refugees, raping many women and young girls, including a 12-year-old who jumped into the ocean and drowned herself. About that, Thich Nhat Hanh writes, Han writes, when you first learn of something like that, you get angry at the pirate. You naturally take the side of the girl, and you look more de as you look more deeply, you will see it differently. If you take the side of the little girl, then it's easy. You only have to take a gun and shoot the pirate. But we can't do that. In my meditation, I saw that if I had born in, been born in the village of the pirate and raised in the same conditions as he was, I would now be the pirate. There is a great likelihood that I would become a pirate. I can't condemn myself so easily. In my meditation, he continues, I saw that many babies are born along the Gulf of Siam, hundreds every day. And if we educators, social workers, politicians, and others do not do something about the situation, in 25 years, a number of them will become sea pirates. That is certain. If you and I or I were born today in those fishing villages, we might become sea pirates in 25 years. If you take a gun and shoot the pirate, you shoot all of us, because all of us are to some extent responsible for this state of affairs. That's Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist, po uh, Buddhist monk. He wrote a long poem, Please Call Me By My True Names, about the many ways we each have the potential for both good and evil. And in it, he asks, can we look at each other and recognize ourselves in each other? Can we look at each other and recognize ourselves in each other? If divinity exists at all, our principles would imply that we are all divine beings. But that doesn't mean that we are all good. As with the worth and dignity inherent in all of us, our goodness must be cultivated. Another way of saying this is that we must encourage and nurture our better angels, that part of ourselves that experiences the feeling of Shug described and is inspired by that, inspired to do what we can to address the world's suffering and to heal the world's brokenness. Like the monk said, if we do not do something about the situation in 25 years, a number of them will become sea pirates. We're all, to some extent, responsible for proverbial sea pirates. And they are everywhere, not just roaming the oceans. There is a deep longing in the human heart for being so special that they can lead humanity toward our highest aspirations. And we have reason to believe that longing for this is a good thing, is, is, is a reasonable thing, is possible, because indeed, they have come. Time and time again, they have come. Jesus came and the world was changed. Time and time again, such beings have come and dwelt among us and led us to some new and more dignified and more enlightened sense of ourselves as a species, or what it really means to be human beings in whom God dwells. But we can't just wait for special beings. We each have a part to play. We may even be one of those special beings, or our children or grandchildren may be. We may be a doer, an encourager, a helper, a cheerleader. What if God was one of us? What if God is all of us? During the season of love and hope, 
May the spirit of Christmas come to each of us. May our faith in the worth and dignity of each person be rekindled. May we recognize and honor the God in each person we encounter, even when their better angels are hidden. And may we know, not just in our heads, but deeply, that we are connected with all that is. May it be so. Amen. And now let's remain seated and enjoy our closing hymn, which is another video. This one is We Are by Dr. Yese Barnwell and the UUA General Assembly Choir of 2020. Uh, it's a virtual choir. Those of you who watched the General Assembly service uh, with us will maybe recognize this piece. Please feel free to hum along if you are out, or even if you're outside, if you want to sing along, that's fine. We are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born. A morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage. Fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages, we are our grandmother's prayers. of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth, and keepers of faith, we are makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages, we our grandmother's prayers, we, we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the birth of our ancestors, we are the spirit of God, we are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, we of God for each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are for each child that's born a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are we are A man once stood before God, his heart breaking from the pain and injustice in the world. Dear God, he cried out, look at all the suffering and anguish and distress in the world. Why don't you send help? God responds, I did send help. I sent you.
We extinguish the flame, but not the spirit that binds us each to one another. May it carry us through this Advent season. Amen.